good day, sir. Have a good day, my man. Yes, sir. Old mother. Old man. Who the f are you calling him? Really? You the ugliest two sisters I've ever seen in my life. Check out the wildest, most intense moments on Hardcore Pond, where customers and staff bring the heat. And also get ready for some serious craziness at the pawn shop. Just another day at the pawn shop where we've got a mix of decent customers and, well, some pretty pathetic ones. Take this guy, for example. He may seem all laid back, but is he really? <laughs> what you got here? A watch my grandmother gave me. Uh huh. Wow, this dude received a watch from his grandma, which is pretty sweet, right? But here's the thing. He's convinced it's solid gold and expects a fat stack of cash for it. Well, let's hook him up with the amount he's hoping for. Let's find out. 500. The problem is the metal on it is just stainless steel. Well, the metal on it is just stainless steel, so that's disappointing. But how will this guy take it? Yeah, you see these, this discoloration on the side? No. You don't see the rose? Whoa, hold up. This dude just flat out rejected it without even taking a peek. Talk about a major red flag, am I right? Less than explain. It was in between the links were gold plated. The gold plating had rubbed off. The watch had no value. And then this guy's like, can I get someone else to check it out then? Because Les shut down his hopes of getting any cash. Whoa, okay, Mr. Expert. This dude is seriously not happy about it. Value. It does have value. How about your chain? You want to pawn me your chain? Anyway, being the sweetheart that he is, Les brings in another dude for a second opinion, just to be fair. But what happens next is totally mind-blowing and straight-up disrespectful. Brace yourself for this one. It's going to shock you. Does this bozo know what he's doing? Well, I wouldn't really call him names. Seriously, this dude needs to chill and get a grip. I mean, who does he even think he is? Anyway, from that point on, things started spiraling down, and honestly, it's for all the right reasons. 500. Nothing. Stop being a bitch. Now, Les ain't about to tolerate any disrespect, and nobody should. And this jerk is about to experience a dose of his own medicine. And let me tell you, it's not a pretty sight. Check out what Les has in store for him. Give me my mother man. Come over here and pick this bitch. Oh, man, this dude is about to get serious flipping off. I kid you not. You know what goes down with idiots like him? They're in for a rude awakening. Yo, you. Get him here. Let's go, my man. Have a good day, sir. Have a good day. Gotta admit, that was seriously hilarious. What did Les have to lose? Nothing at all. But this guy, oh, yeah, he got exactly what he deserved. The man just couldn't stop with the curses. <laughs> yes, sir, let yourself out. Come on, let yourself out. Oh, you think this was intense? Well, hold on tight because you haven't seen anything yet. So this dude walks in, right? And he brings in some equipment, no beating around the bush, and straight up expects a cool hundred bucks for it. And you believe that? Like, I'm trying to get at least a honey for it. $100? Yeah. I won't even be able to sell it. For well, the guy just flat out tells him that there's no way he can cough up a hundred bucks. So the customer's disappointed. But hey, at least he's keeping his cool, right? So how much can you give me, huh? 20 bucks? Well, we're clueless about what this dude's going to pull off next. But hold up. Seth comes swooping in to handle the situation like a boss. Let's see how he tackles it. Getting on the back. Do you know what it is? It don't matter how many you sitting on sure, in the back. because then I can't... Well, things are seriously heating up, and it's turning into a real mess. Seth tries to talk some sense into the guy, but he's just not cooperating. And instead, he's shouting like there's no tomorrow. Dollars for this. You paid 200 for that, I ever heard? Yeah, I mean... Really, that's you paid 200 pay. So Seth breaks it down for him, saying it's not even worth 100 bucks. But this dude is now causing a scene, making a big fuss that's grabbing everyone's attention, to be honest. I'm, about, I'm trying to get money for it. I've been waiting in this line for an hour. I need more than two. This guy seriously needs to calm down. He's dropping way too many curse words. And honestly, it's going to be his one-way ticket out of the shop. That's when Les steps in to take charge. Let's see how that plays out. You gonna do old man? Who are you calling old mother? Old man. No way. He actually said that? Like seriously, what the heck? This guy just keeps digging his own grave making the situation even worse for himself. Brace yourself, because what he does next is going to leave you absolutely stunned. Oh, no. Really, mother I got this. I got it. You want to give me more than 20? Oh, my God. Seriously? Can you believe it? This dude actually tried to mess with Les and thought he could get away with it without being kicked out. That's some messed up behavior right there. Like, what on earth was he even thinking? I wait for an hour. Really? me? you. Well, he totally got what he deserved. But guess what? 
that's not even the end of it. Brace yourself for this next one. So, this lady strolls into the store wanting to treat herself to a fancy watch. She's all sweet and ready to drop some cash. What could possibly go haywire, right? This will be good. Okay. This one. This is really pretty. Now, this lady is seriously contemplating whether she should go for it or not. So, what's your take on it, guys? You think she'll end up taking it or not? That's really pretty. It's really Looks pretty. Looks good on you. It was 100. 100. Okay. She went for it. Well, everything's going pretty darn smooth so far. I don't want to jinx it, though, so let's just wait and see what unfolds next. Here. No. What is this? It's a $100 gift card. $100 gift card? Hold up. Is that for real? She whips out a gift card with all this confidence, and hey, is that some kind of new payment method now? Ashley looks totally baffled by this turn of events. Not a gift card. What would you call it? Is These that are for customers. Right. Man, this lady is already super worked up the moment Ashley spills the beans that it's not a gift card, and she goes on to explain the situation. Talk about major agitation right off the bat. He loves you discounts on the sales floor. You can't swipe this card and apply. This lady is seriously cut off guard and maybe just can't handle the fact that it's not a gift card. And well, she's getting a bit too aggressive, folks. You know, the kind that usually gets shown the door and tossed out of the shop. Turn around and swipe it, okay? There's no swiper on this. So you telling me I'm losing? I gotta say, this lady is giving me some major secondhand embarrassment. I mean, it's crystal clear that the card cannot be swiped. Like, come on, that's basic common sense. But no, this woman just kept on making a complete fool out of herself. Yeah. I don't understand up in here, okay? Because you didn't choose to swipe. Hold on one second, right? let me explain this. About Man, the way this woman is yelling, it won't be long before she gets the boot from the pawn shop. This customer is completely unreasonable, dude. But hey, props to Ashley for still trying to explain things calmly and patiently. Hey, what, what, where do you see a swipe thing on this? Do you see a swipe? Someone needs to rein in this woman because the way she's throwing a fit over a gift card is seriously ridiculous. I mean, does she not even realize how foolish she looks? Just look at her, still going on and making an absolute spectacle of herself. Somebody want to buy a preferred gift card? There's not a hundred on it. There's not Man, people can really lose it sometimes. It's wild. And last but not least, we get this other dude who goes absolutely bonkers. But here's the kicker. It's not about something he wants to buy or pawn. Now, you might be wondering, what on earth set him off then? Well, keep watching to find out. Hey, how you doing? I'm here to buy an engagement ring. So No kidding, this guy is actually here to buy an engagement ring. Whoa, that's some exciting news, isn't it? Les coolly presents a selection of engagement rings, and you'd think everything would go smoothly, right? Well, except for the blaring car horns outside, because of course, nothing can be too easy. Oh, damn! So that's the reason for all the honking? There's a massive truck just sitting smack in the middle of the parking lot. Now, take a wild guess. Whose truck do you think that might be? Come on, give it a shot. It's not rocket science. Semi truck. And then it's white gold. Oh, that's me. Sir, can you ding, ding, ding. It's none other than this guy. So Les politely requests him to move his truck from there. And what do you think his response was? Find your place to park? Oh, man, come on now. I got, I'm in a hurry. I can't be moving yeah. my truck in this. Yikes. Did he seriously say that? I mean, how do some people not have basic common sense? Did he genuinely think he was doing the right thing? Les is clearly not putting up with it, and you could totally see that. You don't have an option. You have to move your truck. I'll be more than happy to show you. Can you believe this guy had the nerve to straight up say no? Well, let me tell you, things are about to take a turn for the worse for him. But just when he thought he couldn't dig himself any deeper, he goes ahead and proves you wrong. Why are you so rude? I'm not moving the damn truck. Byron, take over. Well, obviously he's about to get kicked out, and trust me, you gotta watch this. It's absolutely hilarious. Move the truck. Come on, man. That, that's wrong, bro. Next time, parking on the freeway. This dude should be totally embarrassed about his behavior. And oh boy, he didn't stop there. He just kept on going. And the last straw was this. Move your truck! Silver Surfer. Oh, guess what? We've got a bona fide comic enthusiast here. Big surprise. Like, who isn't, right? Well, this guy's taking his passion to a whole new level. Feast your eyes on what he brings in. That's a silver surfer. Silver surfer. Life size. Tell me about it. Well, this was a display for the Fantastic Four Rise of the Surfer movie. Uh, they made 1,500 of these, and plywood board, it is wrapped in a vac metal plastic wrap. Oh, what a shocker. It's a collector's item. 
But hold up emotions, people, because it's got a price tag. I'm not sure if the experts are gonna agree. Well, online, these things go for $3,000. Actually, Silver Surfer was voted in the top 50 recognizable comic book heroes in America. I mean, I really went 2,000 for it. I am willing to buy this from you for 500. Hey, genius. If you're after that dream price, maybe hit up a comic store. Selling your treasure trove at a pawn shop? Yeah, real brainiac move here, buddy. 900, 900 bucks, that's it. I think I'm gonna have to walk. All right, well, it was a pleasure. We're gonna go surfing on home. See you later. Custom made electric chair. Folks, take a puff. We've witnessed all sorts of weirdness at the pawn shop, but this fella's cranked it up a notch. Check out his wild sell list. So tell us a little bit about him. We have Halloween retail stores. This is a custom made electric chair. There's a whole show if you guys want to see it. Come sure, here, go watch show us. Hell yeah! I'm really into this kind of thing. This might be the new feature at my house on Halloween. Oh, just what we all need a bedside toy that screams Halloween 24 7. No biggie, except it's art, not like living in a slasher fic or anything. Uh, so we're looking to get about $8,000. Brand new, they're just above nine. And that cool. makes a lot of sense. Right. Buy a used one that's six years old. Well, the for cool thing thousand. about this one is that they don't make them like this anymore. You're There's right, they major. don't. The new ones are digital. Well, guys, Mr. Ambitious over here is dead set on this mystery item. Heaven knows what his grand plan is, but Les has a style for a bargain. Thank you very much for bringing Thank it you. in. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, my bad. Damn it. I'm a little disappointed that I gotta schlep it back home, but you know, with Michigan being, you know, like the number one state for haunted houses and attractions and things like that. Elephant skull haggle. Oh, guess what? No fancy sofa, no blingy ring, and no one-of-a-kind car to pedal? No worries. How about you trade an elephant skull for some greens? Because that's normal, right? The skull of an elephant. Really? Very unusual. It's very unusual. My best friend had it, passed away, and I inherited this one. It's where the tusks were. I understand that. It came from Africa? Yeah, right. Well, so. I can promise you nobody has ever brought in an elephant skull, yeah. ever. That I can Little tell unique. You. Ever wondered where one finds a thing like that? Well, surprise, surprise, there's a thriving market for massive elephant skulls. Yeah, you heard it right. Skull heads. Thousand. That's as low as I'm gonna go. Let me talk to my elephant expert. Africans are buying now for 2300 and the Asians are 1900 The good part was, it's worth the money. There is a demand for elephant skulls, but I'll be damned if I'm giving it away. Okay, peeps. When Les locks onto something, prepare for a solar eclipse, because he's not releasing his grip. Anyway, there's a plot twist in this pawn shop drama. I got $700, $100 bills waiting for me. $750. 700 and if you think it's worth $50 for you to schlep at home, it is. Schlep it. It is. Schlep it. I'll give it to you for seven. <laughs> you got a deal. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Come you. right thank over you. here. We'll thank take you. care of you. All right. All right. Yeah. Mark, thank you. Bone Rattler. Okay, people. The granddaddy of speed in the house. Ready to snatch up a drag racing car from the pawn shop? Who knew shuffleboard was just a warm-up? This guy is an expert. He knows all about drag racers. So does Jeff. Jeff is my jeweler, but he's much more knowledgeable with engines than I am. The guy that sold it to me said it cost him 85000 to put it together. Probably clipping along at about 250 miles an hour. Fire this puppy up. I don't know how to start it. Gather around, youngsters. We got a drag racing sage here, boasting a mere 30 years under his belt. So the wisdom dump is here, as he schools the pawn shop owner. You know how to start him? Sure. I knew you did. How long have you been racing dragsters? For about uh, 30 years. <laughs> oh. You ready for this? I'm ready when you are. All right, Mr. Been There, Done That. Let's see if your drag racing tails can seal this deal or take a nosedive. Now, coming straight to the negotiation. 20 grand. 7,500? I don't think so. If you give me the money today, 15,000. I'll throw the skeletons in for free. We have a deal for 15000 I guess so. Thank you very much. Have a Enjoy good day. your new car. Mechanical bull. Ah, the good old days of Wild West bull riding and rugged cowboys. Some dude missed the memo that it's not exactly the trendiest scene nowadays. Time to catch up, y'all. Going for a ride in my parking lot, or what are we doing? Let's have a little fun, girl. We're trying to sell our mechanical bull. Why do you have it? A Western themed restaurant, bar, before, and uh, that was the theme. We put it, the bull in the, into the bar. Well, slap on those cowboy hats. We got ourselves a scene here. 
But seriously, who's taking bets on whether they can wrangle a decent price for that rodeo-style bull riding? Let's say you were to buy these brand new. How much do they cost? They cost around fifteen to 20000 How much do you want? 15000 So if I was to buy this brand new or buy this used from you, it's the same price. Rental companies rent these out for seven fifty a day. There's a lot of revenue potential. Ah! Man, sad to see these alpha men taking back their bull home. But folks, hold on to your hats. Maybe Ashley has something else in her mind. 3,000 right now. 45. 31. 39, you pack it up. That's my bottom dollar. 34. I can't do it. Sorry, good luck. Dr. Death's van. Step right up, viewers. You've heard of Dr. Death. But today's highlight is the van that spotlights as the ride for assisted suicides. Because nothing says vacation like a one-way ticket, right? This is a 1968 Volkswagen okay. van owned by Dr. Death, Jack Kevorkian. By Dr. Death. This is the actual van that he did his first and several other assisted suicides in. Jack Kevorkian was an iconic figure in the city of Detroit. We're not aiming for a Valley of Chrome farewell tour this time. Mr. Big Bucks here wants a six-figure sum. Brace yourselves, because Les has his few concerns all queued up. It is a piece of history. Um, I like buying weird You won't find another one. The problem is, it doesn't make sense to spend six figures on something like this for me. Well, you either love it or hate it. But I, I love it. This is definitely a piece of Detroit. A van oozing that delightful combo of creepiness and death vibes. So legit. However, why not throw in another expert opinion? Let's see how that went. So 10,000 ain't gonna buy it. No, I'm really, I'm in the six figure range. 20 grand? No. 25 grand. 30 grand. 50 grand? 30. One time, 50. 30, 30 cash right now. Bizarre bikini. Check out this granny of the century who strolls into the pawn shop with an elderly figure that has a lot to do with, uh, I don't know. You have a look and maybe you decide. Which is the doll? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> I'm undressing her. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? A really nasty looking woman, but a very cool item. Yep, that's about accurate. You just saw a long-legged granny in a bikini. All the efforts are done in the name of art. However, our granny here invested in this model. How much did you want for this thing? I'd like to get $500 for it. This thing is art. It's a very cool item, but not for that price. I mean, she's really cute. I mean, she's really fun to look at, but it's not going to be even close to 500 bucks. Never mind. That was going to be a deal breaker. Unless Les had some more quotes to add to the art piece, this stirs things up for the selling mix. Here, this woman was playing my game, and I was losing. 200. 190. I'll take it. We, will he stop? Okay, schlep it home. You know, I heard my dad saying it wasn't worth the extra ten dollars. Bullshit. She wants two hundred. Latex vacuum bed. Look who's spicing up the pawn shop scene. This dynamic duo's got a latex vacuum fetish bed up for grabs. You know, just your average afternoon errand. Latex vacuum bed. A what? A latex, a latex vacuum, vacuum bed. So you have sex with latex? Pretty much. Uh, it's like the autoerotic asphyxiation. Pretty it is, much, right? yeah. Bobby J surprisingly knew exactly what this thing was. All right, I was wondering, who needs candle at dinners when you can have vacuum sealed intimacy? I'm not here to judge. However, here's a quick demonstration. So normally when Felix has his hand over his mouth, <laughs> normally what they like. I actually used it. Are you breathing? There we go. Not gonna work. It's working. Okay. Everyone's a critic when it comes to, oh, what's the word? Uh, innovative sleeping arrangements. Yeah, there we go. And we aren't sure if that ever went up for the big sale. Used it. So how could you not want to do this with him? Because I don't want to suffocate. <laughs> um, it's not for everybody. I'm familiar with the bed. Very much so. Just imagine having sex now. He don't have to hold you. Perfect. Well, now we got that out of the way. Just a normal fine day when this guy walks into the pawn shop to sell Les Paul's document collection, including an incredibly unique and world's one-of-a-kind Les Paul SG guitar that belonged to his Aunt Mary. And guess what? She wasn't just some guitar lover or a casual Les Paul fan. Hey, Aunt Mary just a guitar fan or? No, Les Paul's wife. This belonged to Mary Ford? Mary Ford. Yes, you heard him right. 
she was actually Mary Ford, the wife of the legendary Les Paul himself. Pretty surprising, right? Les Paul is practically a legend in the music world. He's known for creating The Log, which was one of the earliest electric guitars, and he held patents for various innovations in pickups, amplifiers, and pretty much everything related to electric guitars. In the 1950s, Les Paul and Mary Ford topped the charts with over a dozen number one hits and sold millions upon millions of records. The documents included in the collection consist of correspondence between Les Paul and his manager, as well as his signed contracts. No doubt the pawn shop literally hit the jackpot with this collection. You might be wondering why someone would sell such a rare item. Unfortunately, it's because Mary's nephew had some debts to pay off. So, the seller is hoping to get a quarter million dollars for this collection. The big question is, is it really worth that much? And is it still in good enough condition to fetch a high price? Let's find out. Rick Harrison calls for Drew, the expert from Authentic Autographs Unlimited, who specializes in forensic document examination. He then carefully examines the signature on the guitar and remarks that Les Paul had a unique and straightforward signature style. Interestingly, Drew notes that he never included his last name when signing autographs. He goes on to say, All right, well, you got a fantastic collection here. I don't see any evidence really of a secretarial. Uh, the consistency of the first name is uh, right where we want it to be. Afterward, Rick contacts Jesse, the proprietor of Cowtown Guitars. Just with one look at the guitar and Jesse's jaw dropped to the floor. You know what it's worth? Wow. Dude, this is amazing. I, I can't even believe I'm holding this in my hands. Mary Ford's Les Paul, this is absolutely crazy. And the most exciting part is that this old damn guitar works. Nah, scratch that. It freaking rocks. <laughs> All right, so it works? Yeah, yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> okay. He further adds that the instrument carries a rich history and is worth a freaking fortune, like a cool six figures. But the exact value? Well, Jesse finally figured that out. Probably 150. I don't see why you could not get that with the documents, the history. Then Rick asked the seller, how much is he expecting from it? So he was like, I want 250,000 for it. But Rick was like, nah, man, there ain't many buyers out there. They haggled and ended up settling on $90,000. It might seem like a huge profit made by the seller, and Rick, on the other hand, had to shell out a crazy amount of cash for that guitar. And can you believe it was his first time dropping the much dough on a guitar? Insane, right? But someone in the comments section went all out and said that those papers would fetch a whopping 190 grand if Joe Bonamassa got his hands on them. Another user totally agreed with him and even said that if this guitar showed up in the right magazine, some millionaire rock star would easily drop at least 200,000 for it. But here's the main part. Did the pawn shop actually make any profit? Hell yeah, they did. Once the show aired, they wasted no time and threw that bad boy up on eBay. And guess what? They scored a whopping $110,000 for it. They ended up making a cool $20,000 profit, guys. Now that's what I call a successful hustle. Next up, we have a customer who came in trying to sell a sword that was supposedly forged by the famous Yasutsugu family, known for making weapons for badass samurais back in the day. But here's the twist. The seller looked familiar to Corey. It turned out that he had been there before to sell a trophy. You'll be thinking what kind of trophy it must be. Maybe some ancient artifact or something, right? But no, it was actually a Grammy Award. <laughs> yes, all in excitement, Rick bought it. But later he found out that it was not allowed to be sold. Oops, I can see a great loss there. Because of that now, they had to be extra careful before dealing with this sword. They weren't sure if it was a legit samurai sword or just some ninja knockoff. The seller is a lawyer and claimed he had received the sword as payment for his legal work. Pretty cool, huh? Some users are even cracking jokes about why the guy was so willing to sell such a masterpiece. One such comment was he must have been scared of his wife's anger, whose eyes are always fixated on that sword. And if she ever gets her hands on it, she's ready to knock him off. <laughs> Talk about a dangerous situation. Another user said he got robbed? Hmm, well, we have to wait to see the actual plot. Taking the lawyer's word for it, Corey decided to take the risk, and then he went ahead with the purchase, even without having an expert to check its authenticity. I mean, let's be real, that was pretty foolish, right? 
I mean, who was going to check if the thing was actually legit or not? So they asked the seller how much he wanted for it, and he said $5,000. The buyers were skeptical about its condition and started throwing offers as low as 800 bucks. That's a crazy drop. But the seller fought back, saying every bit of that sword is worth the full $5,000. If you're going to hold my feet to the fire and make me pay as much as I can, it's going to be $1,500. I'll come down to 2000 I've got five of them right there. The shop wasn't ready to pay that much without knowing more about it. So Corey went up to 1200 bucks. He was trying to get the best deal he could, but the seller didn't budge. They went back and forth until finally, the seller settled for Corey's offer of 1500 bucks just to get Rick off his back for that Grammy thing. After buying the sword, Corey was not at peace and was restlessly waiting for the expert who was out of town during the appraisal. Finally, he got to meet up with Mike Yamasaki, the expert, and Corey explained how he took a shot in the dark and bought the sword without knowing if it's actually worth the money. So, after taking a small glimpse at it, Mike recognized it as a samurai sword and told Corey the history of the sword. He stated that after World War II, around 3 million Japanese swords were taken out of Japan by the occupying forces. In those days, the Japanese warriors, also known as samurai, were skilled professional fighters and the samurai sword was like their badge of honor. If you didn't have one, no way you could call yourself a samurai, man. Then Mike decided to inspect the sword and took a closer look at it. This is the proper way to take apart a Japanese sword. They've been doing this style for centuries. Well, after the inspection was done, the expert discovered that the sword belonged to a super important samurai with ties to Japan's imperial family, probably from the fifth generation. Now, here was the interesting part. The Yasutsugu family only worked for high-level samurai, and their signature mark, like a logo, was detailed on the handle. It's the family crest of the Tokugawa family, who ruled Japan for a couple of centuries. And if anyone tried using it without permission, they'd end up losing their heads, along with their whole damn family. Scary, right? Well, it seemed that the sword had some serious historical value. Now, the big question is, how much is it worth in today's time? After considering the condition, the expert estimated that it can be restored for around $3,000. But here's the exciting part. After the restoration and blade sharpening, Corey could potentially sell it for a whopping $15,000. That's a tenfold increase from what he paid for it initially. So there you have it. Corey took a risk, bought the sword without knowing its true value, and it turned out to be a jackpot. But that was indeed a risky game. But does it always turn out to be luck, or sometimes they just lose everything? Well, we'll see this in the next episode where a customer from Season 16 walks into the pawn shop, hoping that the shop will take his 1700s flintlock pistol off his hands. This thing is ancient and looks fascinating for being so damn old. But the funny part, the gun looked puke color. Did you do the amazing restoration on it? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the history of this gun. Now, the invention of the flintlock pistol back in 1615 was a total game changer in warfare. But here's the thing, Hector, the seller, had no idea about the pistol's origin. It was passed down to him by his father, and he's looking to score 500 bucks for it. But Rick has some concerns. It's pretty darn obvious that this thing has been messed with. So he decided to call in his arms expert, who knows his stuff when it comes to guns. Finally, the expert Alex Kramer arrived. He's the CEO of International Military Antiques. He takes one look at the pistol and straight up calls it ugly. Ouch! Apparently, some shoddy paint job messed up the gun, and it can't even be opened properly. But hey, on the bright side, the details and engravings on the pistol are top notch. They got this fancy style called grotesque with all these weird looking human and animal shapes. And the markings underneath are high quality too. Too bad the paint on the lock is so thick that they can't even see the gunmaker's name. That would have helped figure out when and where it was made. Now Rick's super curious if this thing is actually worth anything. The expert takes a quick look and comes up with an estimate. I think it would be about $1,000. Once we restore it, if I can get it functional, I think it's at least $3,000. With that estimated value in mind, Rick decides to make an offer. So. I will give you 150 bucks and relieve you of your problem. <laughs> What'd you do, 250? Damn, just 150 bucks? Even though Alex said it was worth five grand, Rick always pulls out the excuse that it's hard to sell and there aren't many buyers out there. 
After a short negotiation, the seller settles for a mere $200. I know, unbelievable and kinda unacceptable. But since the gun isn't in great working condition, I guess it was the best they could do. Rick decided to take a chance and handed the gun over for restoration. Will it hit the jackpot or loses $200? Let's see. After a successful restoration job, Rick receives some surprising news about the gun's value. It has brought back all the original details and made it look absolutely gorgeous. And guess what? It turned out even better than expected. With all of the engraving on the brass, that grotesque mask came out really well. Uh, it did come out amazing. But Alex hasn't tested it yet because he wanted Rick to witness its sight. And the best part? If this baby shoots, Rick might get a whopping $5,000. Damn. Well, let's watch if it works. I got my headphones on, so I can't hear you. Yeah! <laughs> oh, it worked perfect! So after successfully restoring the item and getting it in working condition, Rick could be making 5000 bucks on an item he bought for just 200 bucks. That's a crazy profit of 4800 bucks. Absolutely hard to believe, right? Someone even commented that Rick straight up robbed Hector in broad daylight. <laughs> Users are not holding back with their savage opinions. Well, keeping everything aside, this was indeed one of the craziest profits earned at Pawn Star Shop. Moving on. In this episode, Rick bought what he thought was a fancy Polish medal from a regular customer for a whopping $6,000. He had no clue about its real value, so he called in the military antique expert Craig Gottlieb to take a look. And what do you know? It turned out that the medal wasn't even technically Polish. Talk about Rick questioning his own existence, right? Uh, first of all, it's not technically Polish. What do you mean, not tech? To clarify things for the confused Rick, the expert spilled the beans. Turns out this medal had a Russian background. Back in 1795, Poland got divided into three parts, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And guess who got the largest slice? Yep, Russia. This particular order was established way back in 1325, and the White Eagle is basically Poland's symbol. It's on their national emblem and everything, but they changed things up and stuck the original style of the award on top of a Russian Imperial Eagle, which has two heads. So what we got here is a Russian order, and that's what this medal represents. It's a piece of history that dates back 800 years. Pretty neat, huh? Well, neat in the sense of 800 years of Poland's struggles, constantly being conquered, reconquered, and fighting for their freedom throughout their entire history. Users also shared how this whole episode reminded them of their beloved history classes back in their school days. It brought back memories of learning about the triumphs, tragedies, dramas, and even the occasional humor that filled those lessons. With the background story out of the way, Rick finally gets down to the burning question, what's the damn thing worth? Because obviously he bought it without knowing its worth. I, I took a big shot in the dark. How big a shot? Last $6,000 I shot. can sense the tension all over his body. Finally, the expert takes a closer look at the metal and starts talking about how it was probably made in St. Petersburg by a company called the House of Bolin. And guess what? They were like the main competitors to Fabergé. So we're talking about a metal of Fabergé quality here. Crazy enough to give Rick some hope. But Craig kept going on and on about how gorgeous the metal is, making Rick all anxious and begging him to stop teasing and spill the beans about its worth. And finally, he does. Aren't you curious just like me? 30 to 40 grand. 30 to 40 thousand dollars. <laughs> That's incredible. Damn, the metal is valued at around 30 to 40 thousand dollars? That's awesome. And it definitely brought a big wide smile on Rick's face. But hold up. Sadly, Craig has some serious concerning news for him. Apparently, the market for this specific metal is pretty thin, meaning there's not much chance for Rick to sell it easily. Talk about a check he can't cash, but hey, Craig's always got a solution up his sleeve. So fast forward to a later date when Craig visited the pawn shop to meet Rick and brought with him some exciting news. He got in contact with a guy in Germany who has a box for this metal, has the ribbon for it, and even the breast star. It's all part of a set, you see, but there's a big hole in the guy's box, specifically for the neck order. And Craig just knew that he finally found a potential buyer for the metal, someone who needs to complete their set. Now both the parties are ready to strike a deal. Craig offers him $30,000 for the item, but as we all know, Rick being the savage businessman, tried to negotiate for more. 
even though deep down he knew that's the best he could get. An hour last time you were in. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just flipping this, right? Yes. Okay. I'll give you thirty thousand dollars. Um, um, with... I'm trying to figure out a way to complain about that price. Uh. <laughs> I'm coming out swinging here because I've got it pre-sold and I'm not making a ton here. Uh, thirty thousand dollars. But Greg was fixed with the price. Obviously, Rick is not satisfied, and you won't believe what he asked next. Um, thirty thousand? You buy me dinner? Why not? <laughs> Write me a check. <laughs> Can you believe it? Well, eventually, Rick settles for the thirty thousand dollar offer, which is five times the amount he paid for it initially. Talk about a great deal! With a free meal thrown in too. Gotta love those perks. One person made a comment praising the honesty of Craig noting how he offered a price range for the metal that matched its actual value of $30,000 to $40,000. Despite knowing that Rick had only paid $6,000 for it, Craig could have easily offered a lower price, like $12,000, and made a huge profit. But instead, he respected Rick and still managed to make some money while being fair. This man named Randy walked into the store with a huge ass vending machine. He believes that his machine is from the 1940s. Candy? Yes, sir. You know who loves candy, right? This guy. <laughs> well, Chum, we know your love for candies, but is this deal as sweet as them? This machine sure has Chum's heart, but Randy doesn't even know if it works, and neither does he have the keys to it. Well, let us look into what Chum thinks about it and whether he thinks it would be worth the cost. Just taking a look at it, I mean, it looks pretty rough shape. There is a lot of rust on it. It sure needs a good restoration, but Randy wants a thousand dollars for it. Man, it already needs so much work to be done. I personally don't think it's worth investing so much, but who am I to suggest? Oh, how the chum had been schooled by experience, a lesson etched deep into the fibers of his being. Scarred by past misjudgments and Rick's scoldings, he now approached each decision with newfound caution. But hold on to your seats, for the words that spilled from the expert's lips were nothing short of astonishing. Get ready to be astonished, for the expert's revelation is nothing short of extraordinary. Okay. Whoa. Oh boy. Right? The guts are missing. So what this needs... Man, it is empty inside. All the mechanisms are missing. The expert saved Chum's ass today on this one. The expert adds that in this condition, the machine is max 300 bucks. Whoa, that was a low blow for Randy, it seems. He cannot believe the price dropped from 1000 bucks to just 300 Up and running and painted, obviously. 4500 4500 Okay. Well, this machine is asking too much. Chum noticed it and got the bargain straight from $1,000 to $75, and they just shook hands on $100. Bucks. But a deal is a deal. Let's see how Chum restored it and made it a good sales machine for his own bars. Whoa! <laughs> Holy Chum bar! <laughs> Check it out, right? That is freaking awesome! Whoa, the machine is brand new again. No one can even imagine how it was before. And I know you're thinking no one got furious here, but hey, the video doesn't end here. You see, Rick was not so happy about the sweet gift lying in the garage. Why are your candy bars in it? That's the gift that keeps on giving, Rick. That thing, can, you can sell it for $6,500 to take dollars off it every day for the rest of its life. Rick's fury reaches its boiling point as he directs his anger toward Chum. With intense frustration in his voice, he makes it clear that he's had enough. In a sharp and cutting tone, Rick declares that if anyone wants to get their hands on Chum's chocolate bar, they can simply take a stroll across the parking lot and purchase it directly from the store. No more concessions or accommodations. The message is clear. Rick has drawn a line in the sand, leaving Chum to face the consequences of his actions. It's a harsh ultimatum that hangs heavily in the air, leaving Chum to contemplate the future of their strained relationship. Will Chum take the opportunity to make amends, or will the rift between them widen further? Only time will tell how this explosive situation will unfold. Ah, the timeless dance of irritation between Chum and Rick, an intricate routine that never fails to provoke a symphony of exasperation. As a well-worn melody played on a perpetual loop, Chum's knack for pushing Rick's buttons has become a legendary saga of vexation and amusement. With each encounter, their interactions tread the line between exasperated sighs and affectionate eye rolls, a delicate balance that keeps the audience captivated. The sparks of frustration fly freely, igniting a wild dynamic that has become an integral part of the show's charm. So, dear observer, prepare yourself for yet another chapter in the saga of Chum and Rick's fierce relationship where irritation and amusement intertwine in a dance that never ceases to entertain. Did you know that Chum's not just passionate about candies, he is passionate about diving as well. You can't even imagine what he buys next. He goes to buy a sailboat. 
Yes, you heard it right. A full sailboat. Rick was unhappy about the candy machine. You can't even imagine how he's going to react to this deal. Give you that. Um, minus a little bit of paint and, you know, a little glue and some elbow grease. I think it's in great condition. In the realm of high-stakes negotiations, a pivotal moment emerged when Chumley laid his cards on the table offering a seemingly irresistible deal for a remarkable boat priced at $7,000. But Chum couldn't agree on this price. It was too much. The air crackled with anticipation. As the weight of the proposition hung in the balance, threatening to tip the scales of Rick's patience. It was a make-or-break moment that had the potential to send shockwaves through their long-standing relationship. The stakes were set, and the tension mounted like a pressure cooker nearing its boiling point. Could this be the tipping point that would send Rick over the edge? leading him to unleash his wrath upon Chum Lee? The suspense was palpable, and we are eagerly awaiting the outcome of this risky transaction. Chum made a really nice bargain, and came to $3,800 as the closing price. The boat, I realized I was going to need somewhere to park since it's such a beauty. A better place than right in front of the pawn shop. All right, start right there. Oh boy, get ready for the inevitable fireworks when Rick lays eyes on a massive boat about to be parked right in front of the pawn shop. You just know trouble's brewing. Rick's face turns crimson with anger as he witnesses the chaos ensuing in the parking lot. Shouting fills the air. Ropes are flailing about, and the situation is spiraling out of control. Now, it's up to you to decide how Rick will react. Will he burst out of the shop like a raging bull, ready to lay down the law and restore order? Or will he take a moment to cool down and approach the situation with a level head? Brace yourself for the dramatic clash that lies ahead. What insanity do you guys have going on? What's going on here? But hold on. There's a twist in this tale. Chum steps forward, determined to explain his actions and hopeful that Rick will actually commend him for his endeavors. With a mix of confidence and trepidation, Chum begins to share his motivations and the reasoning behind his seemingly chaotic actions. He lays it all out, hoping that Rick will see the brilliance behind his plan. What do you think? How will Rick respond? Will he give Chum the recognition and praise he desires, surprising everyone with his understanding and appreciation? Or will he continue to be infuriated, dismissing Chum's explanation as nothing more than an attempt to cover up his reckless behavior? Here comes a roller coaster of emotions as this captivating scene unfolds before your eyes. I need a spot to park your 27-foot sailboat that I just bought you. Oh. A look of profound disappointment washes over Rick's face his eyes conveying a mixture of frustration and exasperation. He can't help but feel let down by Chumley once again. With a raised voice, Rick unleashes his discontent, emphasizing the absurdity of the low price Chumley has set for the boat. An abiding remark, Rick suggests that if the boat is being sold at such a bargain, one can only imagine the true condition and quality of the vessel. He acknowledges the undeniable truth that a good boat worth its weight and value would never be sold at such a low cost. The disappointment in Rick's voice is palpable as he grapples with the reality of the situation and his frustration with Chumley's decision-making. It's a moment that highlights the clash of expectations and the unrelenting nature of their dynamic. Poor Corey gets dragged into it for no apparent reason. Supposed to be a manager. You handle this. We're not going to have a boat in the parking lot. Put the boat somewhere. And where I'd like you to put it, I really can't say. Poor Chum, yet again, not appreciated for any efforts. As if the mounting list of Chum's blunders wasn't already enough to incite Rick's fury, an air of suspense fills the room as Chum finds himself teetering on the precipice of yet another foolish choice. Tension crackles in the atmosphere as we hold our breath, waiting to see if Chum will repeat his pattern of misguided decisions. The weight of anticipation hangs heavy, like a dark cloud looming overhead. In the midst of this suspenseful moment, Rick's anger simmers beneath the surface, ready to erupt like a volcano. The stakes are high, and the consequences of Chum's potential misstep could be dire. Prepare to have your mind blown. Have you ever heard of a street-legal pirate ship? No worries if you haven't, because it was a revelation for me too. Picture this, a captivating vessel that sails through the streets instead of the high seas. This audacious individual is actually selling a pirate ship that doesn't navigate water, but instead driven around during parades and events. The sheer novelty of this concept is enough to make your jaw drop. Can you imagine the spectacle of a fully decked out pirate ship roaming the streets, spreading swashbuckling cheer and captivating onlookers? It's an unconventional twist on the nautical adventure, where imagination takes flight on wheels instead of waves, a fascinating change that challenges traditional boundaries and sparks the imaginations of all who encounter it. For a ship, you can actually drive 50 miles an hour on the highway. This is awesome. In a moment of anticipation, Chum captures a picture of the pirate ship and eagerly sends it to Rick, seeking his seal of approval. It's no secret that Chum Lee's heart is set on acquiring this extraordinary vessel. However, 
Rick's response reveals a familiar pattern. He doesn't always share Chum's level of enthusiasm. Despite Chumley's unwavering excitement, Rick's support wavers, casting a shadow of doubt over Chum's aspirations. Nevertheless, amidst the uncertainty, Chumley embarks on an unforgettable adventure on the ship, immersing himself in a world of whimsy and joy. The pirate ship becomes a catalyst for moments of pure bliss as Chumley discovers a sense of freedom and exhilaration that he has never experienced before. It's a testament to the power of chasing dreams, even in the face of skepticism. Join Chumley as he embraces the sheer thrill of sailing on that ship, creating memories that will last a lifetime. If I can make a deal, Rick will think I'm the man. As the wind tussled Chumley's hair and the weather played its part, a symphony of elements converged to enhance his adoration for the float even further. Each gust of wind whispered its approval as if urging him to embrace the exhilaration that danced in the air. The perfect weather conditions seemed to align, creating an enchanting atmosphere that heightened his connection with the pirate ship. With every passing moment, Chumley's affection for the vessel grew as if it were infused with magical essence. In the midst of it all, Chumley savored the joy and freedom that enveloped him, cherishing the sensation of pure bliss as he sailed through the streets on the ship that had captured his heart. As Chumley eagerly awaits Rick's response, hoping for validation and support, his heart sinks when he reads the crushing words that appear on his screen. Rick's text delivers a blow that pierces Chumley's enthusiasm leaving his spirit wounded and his dreams deflated. The message, like a dagger to the heart, shatters the joy and optimism Chum Lee had been clinging to. The heartbreaking reality sets in as he realizes that Rick's words don't align with his own deep-rooted passion for the pirate ship. It's a moment of profound disappointment as Chumley grapples with the stark contrast between his own excitement and Rick's lack of endorsement. Emotions swirl within him, hurt, confusion, and a tinge of resentment. I'm sure he's not going to buy it. He doesn't have any money on him. But he's an idiot. Amidst the tangled web of desires and concerns, Corey possesses a keen understanding of Chumley's nature. He recognizes that once the request to abstain is made, Chumley is unlikely to proceed with the purchase. In this aspect, Rick's fears find resonance in Corey's assessment. The rational part of their minds acknowledges the validity of Rick's concerns. Even if Chumley were to succumb to impulsive desires and make a foolish decision, the stark truth remains. The price of the pirate ship far surpasses his financial means. It looms above his allowance like an insurmountable hurdle, a barrier that cannot be breached without dire consequences. The clash between longing and practicality creates a dilemma that Chumley must confront head on. Will he heed the warnings and let go of the unattainable dream? Or will he risk it all in pursuit of his heart's desire? The outcome hangs precariously in the balance as Chumley grapples with the weight of responsibility and the allure of the forbidden. The owner wanted $250,000 for it. Man, that is a little too much. The last bargain he could agree on was $190,000, man. That is still so much money. Chumley was so sure that Rick would want to get it, until he checks his phone. The Do not buy the float. That was Rick, my boss. The man had been driving Chumley around all of the efforts and explaining it. And all for what, man? Just to get rejected on a text message? Whatever. Oh, sorry, man. Man, I really feel so bad for Chumley. Everyone gives an attitude to my boy here, and he just takes it all. Well, enough of Chumley. Sometimes even Rick makes a mistake, and the great Harrison is not at all happy about this one. A captivating scene unfolds as Bill strides into the store, his presence immediately catching the attention of the Pawn Stars crew. In his possession, he carries a Wells Fargo strongbox, an intriguing artifact that exudes a sense of mystery and historical significance. As if that weren't enough, he adds to the spectacle by unveiling antique balls and chains, further piquing the curiosity of everyone present. Bill, confident in his offering, sets the price at a hefty $2,000, a sum that raises eyebrows and sets the stage for a fascinating negotiation. Oh, we got a Wells Fargo strong box and some antique ball and chain. Okay, you do have a The anticipation builds as the Pawn Stars team contemplates the value and potential of this unique collection. Will they be able to strike a favorable deal that satisfies both Bill's expectations and their own interests? With his vast knowledge and years of experience, Rick's expertise comes to the forefront as he steps into the bargaining arena. Determined to navigate the deal without relying on external advice, confident in his abilities, he draws upon his extensive understanding of historical artifacts and market trends to assess the true value of Bill's offering. Rick's sharp mind is like a well-honed tool, 
dissecting the details and uncovering the hidden gems within the collection. As the negotiation unfolds, his eloquence and persuasive arguments come alive, revealing a masterful display of wit and intellect. Rick's knowledge becomes a formidable weapon, allowing him to strike a delicate balance between fair pricing and maximizing the potential of the transaction. It's a testament to his experience and a showcase of his ability to thrive in the world of bargaining, showcasing the power of a sharp mind in the pursuit of a favorable deal. Electrically welded. See how these have arcs from an arc welder? Sure, okay. Okay, and my other big concern? As Rick utters the phrase, other concern, a flicker of suspicion dances in his eyes, indicating that there may be more at play than just the handcuffs. His discerning gaze scrutinizes the items within the Wells Fargo strongbox, sensing something amiss. What could it be? A forged antique? A replica masquerading as a genuine artifact? The anticipation mounts, and the negotiation takes an unexpected turn as Rick dives deeper into his investigation. Determined to unveil the secrets concealed within the box, Rick further adds that the box might actually be real, but the stuff in it is absolutely not. So that made him a little concerned about it, to which the man explains that the stuff was not in the box. He just kept it all in there. You always see a Wells Fargo strong box and an old Hollywood Western. So this will definitely get a lot of interest from collectors. The bargain started at $1,200, but hey, we know Rick. He is damn good at bargains. He finally sealed the deal at 450. But obviously, we need a piece of expert advice over here. Mark, the man with all his knowledge and his beard, is called back to the store. Have you already bought this? That sounds bad. Mark further tells Rick the bad news. It was a complete fake. Damn it, Rick. Looks like Harrisons get pissed off on this show. But hey, another day, another lesson to be learned, right? Kicking off with this episode, which is sure to give you quite a jolt. Hey, how's it going? The episode just starts with a casual conversation between Rick and an old man. But look what he's got. Yes, my friends, you just laid eyes on an 1884 Colt that was used in the Wyoming Range War, also known as the Johnson County War. Goes with it. There's nothing like a good book after a good shooting. That's what I always say. <laughs> and not to forget the book that comes with it. I mean, you've got to keep the rare flock together. Rick, as usual, begins his quiz, asked a whole lot of questions before investing his money into something that a normal person would have bought in a heartbeat. So how exactly did you get the gun? My father got this from the great-great-granddaughter of Fred Coke. Are these many questions ever asked while I go to sell something antique? Maybe. How would I know? I've just gone to the shops to buy something, never to sell anything. But wait, it seems like he practiced it the whole night, answered all the questions like a pro. That man did better than the rest of us would do in our lives. Tough college times. Wait. What did my eyes just witness? Rick narrating the whole Wyoming Range War story. Basically, large cattle barons feuding with really small cattle ranchers. The small guys were stealing cattle. It felt like a whole history lesson to me. I must say, Rick does have some insane knowledge about antiques. The way he narrated the whole thing was nothing less than an informative history class. Not gonna lie. Moving further, we see Rick's intelligence as he checked all the details provided on the document just like a professional would. It's got a 45 caliber. This is a 45 caliber. It's a five and a half inch barrel. That's a five and a half inch barrel. With this line, when you throw on a personal story that actually ties a cow boy to a gun, that's the kind of thing collectors love. I can see he clearly knows how to hit the proper note. But when you throw in a personal story that actually ties a cowboy to a gun, that's the kind of thing collectors love. Without a second thought, the man quoted $55,000 for the gun. What do you think? Are Rick and the old man on the same page? Well, for you to know that, you have to continue watching. I'd like $55,000. 55000 And obviously, before getting such a huge amount out of his pocket, he wanted a second opinion on the matter for which he called an expert. Get someone down here, he'll tell me if it actually belonged to this guy. To be honest, I really don't get it. How can one identify if it's original or fake by just looking at some words written on a piece of paper? Anyway, who am I to say anything? What we have here, it's really hard to make that connection. Some facts were served right there. Like clearly, who else if not Rick would know more than for how much something like that goes in his shop. And you know, Pawn Stars is all about who bargains best to make the most profit. So let's see who gets to cut the cake tonight. And just when he thought things couldn't get crazier, Rick dropped the price and set his bet to 1500 bucks. And all that effort went to waste right in front of your eyes. Yeah, I don't, I'm just not gonna be able to do that. I think maybe I'll see if I can maybe get some more provenance. That was pretty obvious. No one would want to sell an antique for this measly amount of money. Definitely not a very profitable deal. And with that deal went flying Rick out of Rick's hands. But in this next episode, this person walks in with a really interesting gun. But how interesting? You're about to find out. Yeah, it's like something James Bond would wear. <laughs>
Yeah, right. You just saw that, huh? But that's not out of a James Bond movie. That thing is as real as it gets. What can I help you with? I'm here to sell my ring pistol today. Well, you know how a gun never stays in the shop for long, be it whatever shape or size. But this thing is something I've never seen or even heard of before. Have you ever seen a pistol ring? Boy, you're looking at it right now. This is something definitely worthy of adding to the antique collection list. Come on, you have to agree with me. Everything about this pistol ring is antique, from loading it to the trigger to its hammer. This thing is a killer, literally. You know what? If I ever went undercover on a mission, I would definitely carry this cute little devil. James Bond, we just found your vibe, and I know Rick would agree with me too. Yeah, that man seems very particular about the price he's going to ask for that dangerous ring. I'm looking to get 9000 I'll use it to buy some of the things I collect more often. I personally would wear that ring everywhere. It's an all-in-one combo, kind of a hidden treasure who can double up like your personal bodyguard. It's unreal how cool this thing is. But hey, did Rick just contradict me? Wear them just for fashion. Damn. Rick has got a good sense of humor, not gonna lie. Seriously, getting hit by that mini pistol ring would definitely hurt your ego hard, man. It's also seriously a gun. I mean, it would really hurt getting shot with this thing. And oh, I kid you not when I say that the man clearly did his homework right. He literally asked for nine grand in the blink of an eye. I mean, that piece truly is a showstopper, but that expensive, damn. A nine grand, they're, they're pretty rare. <sighs> So what happened is that the deal took an intense turn, and Rick, being the smartest in this show, had to prove it. So before finalizing the deal, he wanted a bit of expert advice. I mean, that's always better than regretting later, right? So let's see what the expert had to say about this antique pistol ring. The European gunsmiths, uh, they were making all kinds of little weird things. This is the Imperial Protector. Basically. Looks like this tiny mean machine has taken down quite a few people in the past. So it must cost a bomb, but let's hear it from the expert himself. For 11.5. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I really appreciate it. Whoa. I never expected that. 11 and a half K? That's crazy. And just look at the size of that thing. That thing is golden for sure. But as you know, Rick plays by his own rules, and I'm curious to know what he has to offer. I'll give you 3000 for it. <laughs> no, no, can't do it. Okay, so Rick is trying to settle the deal for three grand, but bro, that's like not even half the price the seller asked. Do you think the man will accept the offer? For someone who knew a great deal about the pistol ring, I don't think this man is going to budge. But Rick wasn't ready to give up or give in as yet. So do you think they'd both settle on the same grounds? Who do you think is going to win this round? Well, let me put your anxiety to rest. For here comes the moment you're waiting for. As amazing as this thing is, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. And just like that, Rick missed the chance and saw the extraordinary collector's pride walk right out of his door. But what happened in this next episode is even crazier. Working with an instrument maker and got really, really interested with the harmonica. You know how music instruments can be great collectibles. In which case, what do you think about an ancient instrument that has an emotional connection to it? Does it help double up the price? Well, I don't know about you, but I have never seen a shining gold M. Honer harmonica. We've all played a harmonica once in our lives. Right, we have. Um, and we thought we were good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know who Matthias Honer is, here's a quick history lesson for you. Honer was a trained watchmaker born in Germany. And his company, Math Honer AG, is the oldest and largest producer of harmonicas in the world. If you want to know more about this masterpiece, here's Rick for you. So apparently the watchmaker was so blown away by the piece that this is what happened. So he saw the writing on the wall, uh, but he was also working with an instrument maker and got really, really interested with the harmonica. Rick's knowledge never fails to amaze me. There's no question that he is a master of his job, and his trade skills are even better. But is this going to be a jackpot or a lost cause? Before Rick states his price, he found a problem with the musical piece. You get in the ballpark. Okay, all right. It's plastic, and it's not yeah. in great of shape. I don't know, it's not too bad of shape. The cardboard's coming off. Oh no, that's going to majorly affect the price of this beautiful piece right here. So while the seller was holding on to a grand $500, what Rick pitched was unbelievable. Here's 75 bucks for it. <laughs> it cost 75 bucks, wow. I would feel humiliated if I was that harmonica right now. I mean, come on, man, it's not that bad. But what can I say? Rick knows better. 
and the seller wasn't ready to back up and even had a genuine reason for it. Dollars to fill my truck up with gas right now. I can't take 75. I find the man reasonable. The least you can do is compensate his gas. But as you know, there are no emotions involved in business. Rick's not taken aback by anything and sticks with his price, but he failed to grab the deal. I think he wouldn't mind much though because the harmonica was plastic and it was also peeling off in some places. So sadly, the seller needed to go back home with a broken instrument, and he couldn't even make enough money for gas anyway. Next up, we got this interesting thing that you'd never expect at a pawn shop. The guy just pulled in the parking lot with a boat he wants to sell. So Chum and I- Yes, it's a freaking boat! What you're looking at is a 1958 Sea Flight Glastron, and this is no common sight, y'all. Rick and Chum came to take a look at the huge and fascinating boat, and it looks like they already like what they're looking at. You saw Chevy, didn't they? Sure did. <laughs> Is it a convertible? And how can something start without Chumley's irrelevant questions, right? Like always, he was more worried about the boat being convertible or not. Well, Chum, you definitely cannot expect everything to be fancy, okay? Despite that, I can't help but love Chumley's confidence. Meanwhile, the seller has made up his mind to demand a hefty $10,500 for the boat. Let's hope he can make just as much from the master of negotiation. And this time, the item in question was a timeless beauty, created in 1958, standing tall, defying the effects of time. Whoever maintained it surely did it with the utmost care and dedication. Great work right there, but I think someone is already getting busy coming up with the numbers. It looks just like the 57 Chevy I got for the old man's birthday. It's definitely tempting because- Rick's already deciding how he was going to pitch this look-alike a 57 Chevy. This Glastron boat is awesome, but boats are tough to sell, so it has to be a- Like he already said, boats are money pits. I mean, nobody would want to keep this huge boat in their homes as an antique, quite rare as the word suggests itself. But this seller is definitely giving Rick tough competition. With all that USP knowledge he was throwing about, he came in here ready to face the pawnbroking world. Do you know why? Because it was a little 17-foot boat. No, because it was fiberglass. No more wood boats. Wood boats were moving out. But what happened next was totally unexpected. 10-5. Um... In an unexpected turn, the owner of the boat bravely revealed a startling price tag. $10,500. Wow, that's crazy. What do you think Rick is going to do? Will he buy it or break it? I don't even want to make you an offer. There's too much work that's got to be done for me to make anything. Did you see that? Rick didn't even make an attempt to convince the donor to accept a lesser price. But that's exactly what the show is all about, expecting the unexpected. But you cannot miss this museum piece that just made its entry into the shop today. A man brought in an ancient coin, a portrait of Julius Caesar from the month before he was assassinated. Well, I have a coin here. It's a portrait coin of Julius Caesar from the month before he got assassinated. But before that, quick history lesson. Did you know Caesar was the first living person to be depicted on Roman currency? Back then, this honor was only reserved for the gods. So you can imagine Caesar's position in the society. So you know that having him on a coin is quite exclusive, and any historical coin collector would be yearning to get their hands on this coin. And it would do what was necessary to preserve the Republic. Okay, and no matter what he did in office, Rick was taken in by the intriguing offer, and his sincerity came through, creating a favorable environment for a possible deal. Rick, though, sticks to his strategy since he was logical. As you know, the man is a smart specialist who always seeks professional advice before taking major action. But let's see what the price on offer is. How much were you looking to get out of it? I want 4400 please. Okay. I like this man's confidence and how he's so adamant about the asking price, exactly the way it should be. The style is correct. Everything is right. Okay. It's perfectly genuine. The expert's analysis is giving us a ray of hope with each passing second. So let's see what the experts have to say. $1,500. Retail? Retail. Wait, what was that? $1,500? Are you kidding me? I thought that coin was a big deal. But what just happened? It's ridiculous. I mean, sometimes you can never explain how things turn out to be in the pawn world. Just like this episode where a man walked in claiming to have a 1951 Yankees team signed ball. 1951 Yankees team signed baseball. For those who may not know, the New York Yankees of the 1940s and 1950s were the most dominant team in baseball history. They won 10 World Series titles only between 1947 and 1962 including their five consecutive World Series victories from the 1949 to 1953 season. However, things have now taken a turn and the glory remains in history. Coming back to the item in concern, 
The seller also claimed that the ball had the signatures of around 22 to 23 Yankee players from around that time. And out of all of them, it had the signatures of Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. Had about 22, 23 signatures on the ball. The year 1951 holds a special place in baseball history, as it was Joe DiMaggio's final season and Mickey Mantle's first. Also, Yankees won their 14th World Series that year. Buckle up, because this episode is sure to amaze you. My grandfather went to a game in 1951 with my mother and uh, received the... The seller said that it was his grandfather who managed to get this iconic baseball. According to him, his grandfather went to a game in 1951 with his mother and received the autographs from a friend of his that was involved with the team. Well, sounds fair enough to me. Baseball doesn't really mean a lot to me. It's got some family heritage, but it's a baseball. I wonder why so many people want to sell something that has an emotional connection with them. But the seller's reason behind selling such an iconic ball seems pretty fair to me. This would be perfect for the company softball game. Charmway, I'm fixing to hit you. Charlie was trying to play the fool, but Benjamin remained unaffected, steadfastly focused on the business at hand. Benjamin saw nothing but the business and got right back into it. I don't trust this guy. I don't trust nobody. Especially when you're trying to sell me stuff. Benjamin, I can feel you totally. It's not like we don't trust anybody, but it's always better to be sure when there's a ton of money involved. No doubt the expert had to be called in. I do believe that this is a genuine 1951 Yankees baseball. Whoa, it looks like there's some good news for the man, and we might see some bills going out of the shop. But wait, don't be sure. You never know when the deal goes south. I think $3,000 is a reasonable amount for the ball. With audacity that leaves me breathless, a staggering demand of $3,000 was quoted for the ball. And it's quite obvious as well. After all the authentication and the proof, anyone would ask for that kind of money. They fired about $800. But wait, what? Benjamin just quoted $800? That's it? No one would sell it for that much, Benjamin. But he was in this business before most of us, and I assume he'd know better. So these were some of the times deals got out of hand on Pawn Stars. So which one of these intrigued you the most? Let us know in the comments down below. And don't forget to subscribe for more such videos. And I'll see you in the next one. Until next time, guys.